Hi everybody, thanks for coming today. My name is Jerry Rosick. I'm a professor of education studies in the College of Education here at the University of Oregon. We're really happy to see you here today. I know you're all here to see uh, Monty Neal, the director of Fair Test at the National Center of, uh, for Fair and Open Testing. Um, before we get to that, I want to thank some of our sponsors and co-sponsors. Um, New Education Studies Department is a sponsor of this event. Um, Oregon Save Our Schools. Um, Oregon Parents Across America. Um, angry Grandparents Against High Stakes Testing. <laughs> Their acronym is? Aghast. Aghast. <laughs> Oregon Bats, or Badass Teachers. The Eugene Education Association and the Springfield Education Association and the primary sponsor of this event, uh, the Community Alliance for Public Education, or CAPE. Um, we're really happy to have you here. CAPE and all these organizations have been working for a very long time uh, in the uh, public debate about the use and misuse of high stakes mandatory standardized tests in our public schools. Um, and um, nobody has been more active in that struggle than one of the founders of CAPE, Roscoe Karen. Who's here with us today? Let's give a round of applause for Ross. Uh, Ross is the Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for being here. Uh, 30 years ago, I was in the early stages of my teaching career, and I was struggling still with just trying to figure out how to take role, get an advanced organizer on the board, and not lose control of my classroom <laughs> in the process. Yes. 30 years ago, Monty Neal was uh, building a national organization and taking a critical, deep look at testing and, uh, and the unfairness inherent in a testing in the United States. Uh, the, the fact that there is an opt-out movement in the United States is certainly in part due to the work that Monty and Fair Test have done in raising issues, in researching the tests, in exposing what's behind a lot of the tests, and in helping to disseminate that information so that people in local areas do not feel isolated and alone, but come to see themselves as part of a national movement to push back against incredibly powerful corporate forces. Uh, so Monty is a hero to many people in the United States. But I want to tell you a measure of the man about a month ago, he approached us uh, by email saying he would probably be coming out to a conference in Portland. Would we be interested in him doing a presentation in Eugene? And of course we said, yes, you bet. We'd been wanting to do it for a number of years. And then uh, taking yes for an answer, we proceeded to pile on. And so I asked him, well, since you're going to be here, you know, we got friends in Portland. Would you do a, 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 a nighttime presentation there and you know we've been working hard on administrators and school board members would you be willing to address them and before he knew it or maybe before we knew it he, he just said yes to everything he was just going to be in Oregon for a couple of days he started this morning at a, a meeting with administrators and school board members in the afternoon just a couple of hours ago addressing a meeting of teachers and administrators here he is tonight. He goes back to Portland. He's uh, uh, going to be at the uh, National Council for uh, uh, NCUEA, Urban Education Associations in Portland. Then, later on tomorrow night, he's doing a presentation in Portland. And then Thursday, he's driving to Salem to meet with officials of the Oregon Department of Education, the Chief Education Office, out of the governor's office and leaders of the Oregon Education Association, all on moving forward on alternatives to the testing machine. Uh, and so let's start by welcoming him and thanking him for all of the work he's doing on the behalf of people in the state of Oregon. Monty Neal, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming out. I am very glad to be here. Roscoe exaggerates. I played hardline. I said, I have to go back Friday. I can't wait till Saturday. Um, but I'm happy that I could spend some time here talking to you, talking to other folks. You never know when the seeds will grab with some educators, officials, that something helps. They've been looking for something, some excuse to do something. It sparks something. It always takes, however, 
one of several things. Pressure. People who are organized to make change happen. Um, a willingness or that you can find other people, such as this man, who will run and eventually win. Because some of what I'll talk about is a number of districts where they took over school boards in order to start getting rid of testing. Um, so that can happen. But it takes really some combination of willingness to be open, to think, to try, and force, be it parents or teachers or whomever, that will either provide support or push things so that the system has to change. This is what's going to happen. You know, occasionally you'll find an educator who really just gets it and will take off regardless, and sometimes they end up leaving the community behind and get blindsided um, when an uninformed community doesn't get what's going on or why and becomes prey to kind of, you know, I'll call pedagogical right-wingers or something, or, you know, deep racists who think you're being too nice to the black and immigrant people and therefore not nice enough to the already privileged. Um, that kind of stuff goes on. Um, but really, most of the time, it takes the grassroots efforts of teachers often having to push the unions along, uh, sometimes with the leadership of the unions right there, but often having to move the union itself in order to be a visible force. So what I want to do tonight is talk about a, little, a number of things. What's wrong with the tests, briefly. I'm just going to kind of go through it. Um, how we got to that point. Uh, some alternative possibilities that this, I'll have more up here on slides than I'm really going to talk about, because otherwise I'll be here for a long, long time. Um, and then the resistance, what's going on in places, and, and how to work it. So that's, that's a lot of stuff already. Um, a good education. So I want to ask people um, this, these questions in variation. Just speak up. Give me some ideas. What's a school for? What are the hallmarks or attributes or characteristics of a good, strong education? What should students get out of school? So let's hear some voices. Creativity. Well, public schools are for uh, raising the floor so that children are not limited by what their parents know, but can benefit from what the community knows to be useful information for getting on in life. OK. The, the word education comes from the Greek educare, uh, and which means to bring forth. And I think that uh, in its deepest meaning, it is bringing forth who we are as fully human beings. Other things. Tell us what you want. What do you want to see in schools? What should they offer? Empowerment. Empowerment. Mm -hmm. Inclusion and engagement. Okay. That's a place where we meet to help each other grow, both the students and the teachers. I always like John Dewey's laphorism that what the best and wisest of us want for our children, that we should want for all the children in our schools. Educating, engaged, and active, informed people who can become engaged, active, and form citizens to create the world they want to live in, not in here at the world others are creating for them. Take another couple more. What do you got? What do you, what do you want out of schools? You're young. What would you like? What did you get? What was powerful to you? Um, life skills. Life skills? OK. So this question was asked. Um, by researchers, surveyed thousands of people. And um, there's an economist whose name is going to come to me in a minute. He's got Richard, hmm. anyway, he's got a book out called Grading Education. And in one chapter, he talks about this survey. And they ask, what do you want out of schools? And he asked the general public, he asked educated, and he asked policymakers. And their answers were very, very consistent. And then he broke them out into seven areas. And essentially what those seven areas look something like is basic skills, higher order thinking skills, arts, citizenship, physical health and emotional health and well-being. Um, that's most of them. I don't remember all of them off the top. 
But there's a question. All the ones that you gave out here or that I listed for him, what a standardized test measure? Skills. Memory, skills, which skills? <laughs> Basic literacy and decoding skills. Pencil. Basic literacy and decoding skills. Penciling in bubbles. The things that people most want from, so, oh, arts was another, did I say arts from, yeah. Uh, I was surprised actually not to hear it, that one that comes up a lot. Um, and I've been in different kinds of communities in different places and we ask this question and my colleagues at Fair Test do and other people do and nobody stands up and says high standardized test scores. Somehow that doesn't make it. And when you ask the question, so if this is what's important, why is standardized testing the near be all and end all of what schools are supposed to do? Let's assume, I think not very correctly, the standardized tests are good measures of those basic skills. What about all the rest of it? They either don't measure it at all or they're terrible. There is a slightly negative correlation between creativity and high standardized test scores. It's basically have nothing to do with each other. Um, the higher order critical thinking skills is just simply not measured. The best you can say is there are correlations of depth of knowledge in a subject of the factual level and ability to think in the subject, which makes some sense. If you can think about history, it helps to know something about factually about history also. But it doesn't mean that because you know all of that, those facts that you can actually reason well historically. So <clears throat> what we have now is the reign of standardized tests. And here are some of our issues. Now, some of you saw this at least once already today. I apologize, but there it is. Others of you have not. This is, we were using variations on these slides. The original, we look at the IQ tests are really the parent of all the testing we have now in this country. And those were deliberately designed to sort everybody else, on, sort everybody on a bell curve. So you had to ask questions that would have that result. You also had to have questions you certainly weren't going to contradict a couple of things. First of all, the first tryouts they did, women outscored men. We know women aren't smarter than men, so <clears throat> we changed it so that they wouldn't outscore men. I say we very loosely. I'm not persuaded that's true, but anyway, that was the IQ people had to make that happen. But the main thing was it had to correlate with race and class. So recent immigrants from um, Southern Europe and Eastern Europe were typically mentally defective, according to IQ tests. Ironically, Urban blacks outscored southern whites in the first big round of these tests used in World War I. Why? Because it measured what stuff we're learning in urban situations. Um, they were openly racist. They were openly content bound to knowledge. They built achievement tests, so-called achievement, on exactly the same rounds. They had to correlate with the IQ test or they would have been wrong on some profound level, as it were. So they have always built in this correlation. So when the joke, Alfie Cohn's version of it is, if you want to know what test scores are, look at the zip codes. It's the same thing as the original IQ tests. And to do that, you have to be asking questions that lead people. So there are plenty of educators who say, I know these tests I teach and I know kids can read, but they don't do well on the tests. Now some kids who don't do well on the test can't read well. This is also true. But most any good teacher certainly knows what those tests tell them. As one teacher said, yeah, I look at them, and every now and then something goes, hmm, I didn't know that. Let me, let me explore that a little more. But really, it's fairly minor. Um, <clears throat> but increasingly, we've seen a system where instead of the teachers teaching, you have the test controlling stuff. Those tests are fundamentally multiple choice and short answer. Yes, they have right to a prompt uh, on all, pretty much all of them now. Certainly, Smarter Balanced has that. Um, those often lead to teaching the five paragraph famous so-called essay. Now that could be a useful heurist, you know, teaching device, but really nobody writes five paragraph essays in the real world. So that has just a, maybe a teaching tool, but then you have to go on to real writing. Um, or you do real writing, don't worry about that. That's an argument I'm not interested in. What I am saying is that those tests don't measure much about writing better than no, nothing or only multiple choice questions are writing. But what my grandkids experienced as the tests took over was writing to the prompt. This was what writing was, again and again and again, all year long. And you never learned any other kind of writing. Um, now you have on the computer stuff the drop in the drag, drop in, 
drag sorts of stuff. It's just multiple choice short answer. There's no, not going to assess deeper thinking. Again, if you want to know if kids can multiply, give them a bunch of multiple choice questions. It's true that if you organize them this way instead of this way, you'll get very different accuracy level, you know, the kids will often have very different scores, but you know, we're really measuring the math, right? So the point is these tests are very limited in what they do and are very easy to go in wrong directions. And then it became far too much of it. The big deal here, of course, is no child left untested, demanded, you know, all that testing, uh, grades three through eight, once in high school, and what that induced was actually much worse. Because when you add those up, that's 17 tests. And the average kid takes 112, according to a fairly conservative estimate by a mainstream organization. Um, and it's actually almost certainly higher than that. Um, so what are all those tests come from? Most of those other tests are district-required tests. Some states have added tests. They have some a history test or science in more grades or grade two or whatever. But most of it is district-mandated testing. Interim, benchmark, periodic, predictive, they even call some of them formative, which is a, very much a distortion of what formative assessments are. But nonetheless, there's far too much of it. So what you got is a lot of narrowing the curriculum in order to jack up the test scores, an intense focus on teaching to the test in order to jack up the test scores. Now, understand, some of what's on the test is stuff you ought to learn. So teaching to that is OK. But often the format then becomes teaching the way it will appear on the test instead of other formats as well. Emotional stress starts to rise. It's been starting increasingly well documented by the, the uh, psychological professions and pediatricians writing articles and doing this stuff. And we're seeing more and more of that literature. Parents Across America has some great, go to parentsacrossamerica.org. They have some excellent material on that on their website. Um, student disengagement. And I, lots of teenagers, it's a reason for disengagement from school when this starts to take over. It feeds into student behavior issues that feed the school to prison pipeline. One of the correlations with increased testing is found is to be, you can't say it's causative, it's a correlational study, but it fits the logic argument. Increased, increases in incarceration, it goes through disengagement in school, being pushed out of school, or quitting school, and ending up in that prison pipeline. Um, and the end result is that worst you have schools essentially as test prep programs. Then you have the high stakes for students, schools, and teachers. Now the graduation tests essentially came in in the 1970s. Started the first one in Florida and spread mainly in the south. Note, the first states to do this were all states with large black populations. Uh, the next batch of states to take it were big industrial states with large black populations. Then the southwestern states with lots of Latinos. The mightest parts of this country virtually never had those tests. Massachusetts, my home state, is a sad exception to that. Uh, it did spread. Idaho had them for a while. They've dropped it. It expanded. It reached 26 states, down to 13 now. Oregon, we don't list, although probably it should be listed. They claim they don't have one. Why? Because actually what someone said this evening is most kids graduate by their work showing rather than by the test in Oregon. So they're a borderline case. New Jersey, it's clear, has one. But they also have a serious structural alternative. Some other states have appeals. That, is, in our view, is not a good, not a good difference. So the, the, the high stakes are for students. Some districts and states have grade promotion requirements based on test scores. Tracking is still common based on test scores. So you have high stakes for students. Teachers, most states in the country, Student test scores are a quarter to a half of the teacher evaluation. A few have begun to drop it. Why? The feds do not require it in ESSA. It is simply not there. Oregon leaves it up to districts, so you can win at the district level if you're in a district that requires it. Schools. That was the biggie with no child left behind, was evaluating schools essentially on test scores and virtually nothing else. It's changed slightly, as we'll see. But essentially, the test scores remain dominant. What that means is if you don't jack up the test scores, you're in trouble. Now, under NCLB, everybody was getting in trouble. You know, 80% of the schools in California were failing. You can't do anything about it. It is meaningless. So race to the top swapped out, said, go after the teachers with tests, and we'll let the suburban schools off the hook. That's essentially what the deal was. And they did. And the suburban schools, except the suburban schools kept right on going with this stuff, many of them. Many of them. Why? They're in a race. They want the higher test scores. It props up property values for the real estate companies. This is a major issue now. So there's 
unfair and harmful decisions. Chicago, they closed 50 schools in one year. Now, part of that very clearly was part of their gentrification of the South Loop in Chicago. But part of it was also a method of getting rid of higher priced, older teachers, especially African Americans, because almost every school closed was in the black community, and almost every teacher who was removed was an experienced African American educator. They were replaced by kids, I will call them, I'm an old man, um, no, young, non-trained people from things like Teach for America. And they save a lot of money. Um, so this is the kind of, it comes out of the testing mania. Clearly, one could support charters and not supporting the testing, but the privatization of school has been heavily fueled. And a leading charter proponent, a woman named uh, Nina Reese, Nina Sakurai Reese, she um, said right as it passed, this is great. Now we can prove how terrible public schools are and go for charters and vouchers. Because the end game for, many, for that crew is to eliminate public education as we know it. And everything should be in the market and privatized. Indeed, one of the Cato Institute doesn't believe there should be public schools at all. They openly say it. We don't think there should be any public schools. What, what happened to poor people? I actually saw them on a platform. Well, charity will take care of them. Okay, so don't, don't laugh at this stuff because I did back then. I said, this person's mad. Why are they putting him on a platform? No one can take this seriously. But it is a growing agenda and you have a whole bunch of extremely wealthy hedge funders, billionaires, pumping money in to things like Stand for Children. And that may not be Stan's actual agenda, even their real agenda right now. But they're just one part of a strategy that leads down that road of Milton Friedman's forget public governmental anything. OK. Um, and the last thing in terms of the schools is what I, we call continuous online testing. All of these little programs that are, you do it on a computer, you sit at a keyboard, and the curriculum and the instruction and the test are all in that package. And the test is multiple choice, short answer. Maybe even they have enough sophisticated technology to use a drop and drag. You may have to write a few paragraphs occasionally. But essentially, it's that short answer multiple choice stuff that's not about deeper thinking, and it's termed personalized learning. Why? Because you can proceed at your own pace. There's nothing personalized about it in any human sense. And those things are spreading like wildfire into the suburbs too, not only with poor kids. Because all of the harm is worse where there are poor kids. All of the harm is worse where there are kids with color. Every last piece of this is worse. <clears throat> How do we get here? We have to go back. I mentioned the eugenics, the IQism, the achievement testing was all intended to sort and rank. It did the job effectively and efficiently. The first federal public education, real public education law, was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It was part of President Johnson's war on, war on poverty. And the sec I think it was the first reauthorization. Robert Kennedy said, we need to know if it's effective. And he bought into what the test companies sold him, which was you can use our norm reference achievement tests, which are built to be essentially impervious to teaching, by the way. Um, and you, know, you, you look at those tests, and they're all multiple choice. They've now added some right to a prompt deals in some of them. And they're mostly out of the, nobody pays attention to them anymore. But always, the test scores would go up because teachers would figure out what's on, and they'd teach to it. Then, the, then they'd bring in a new version of it, and the scores would fall like a stone. And they'd go back up, and the scores would, and you could track over decades exactly this. Did it mean anything was improving? Nope. There was some indication from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, that actually things got better for a while in terms of reading and math outcomes on NAEP, which is at least a well-designed standardized test, although it's pretty much all, again, multiple choice and short answer. But it told two things. In the 80s, scores went up, but the racial achievement gap narrowed. What was different? 80s? That's Reagan. Ah, but there's a time lag with kids. One, desegrega uh, deseg uh, desegregation was going on. There was a higher level of integration across race and class than we see now. It's been getting worse and worse and worse, and we're back to the 50s now, essentially. <clears throat> but that happened. And more money was being spent on schools. Um, and those two meant more money went to poor schools. And so this started to close the gap, at least in these core subjects. They got quite narrow at one point for African Americans and white folks. The measurement of Latinos started later. Then, after the Reagan shit kicked in, 
and the end of integration and the resegregation started, they started to widen again. There started to be uptick again in the late 90s um, with um, Clinton was president and there was a relative prosperity which trickled down to the poorest people and there was more money spent on education. The gaps didn't much close, but at least everybody was going up. When NCELB came in, the gap started, to, the whole thing started to flatten. And for the last few years, there's been no gains. Going back from the last four, six years, there's been almost no gains. And it has flattened for almost every demographic that the test measures. That's one of the outcomes. And even on, a stand, even on a test that no one teaches to an independent measure, it's, it didn't work for improving those two so-called basic skills. So the graduation tests I've mentioned in the South, they started in the 80s and spread. Um, no child left behind, testing as accountability, privatization, attacking teachers. Many of you have seen this. You know, the basic message is we have incompetent teachers in this country. Everybody's outscoring us. The everybody was Western Europe and Japan, Hong Kong, which is a city state, Singapore, which is a city state. If Hong Kong, the poor people don't live in, the poor people who work in Hong Kong live in Malaysia. The poor people who work in, in, in I mean, in China, in Singapore, they, work, they live in Malaysia. I mean, it's, you know, so they have, and they all have social welfare systems. They don't have high poverty. If you look at poverty in the United States, look at the, and, and compared to, the US, to, to Europe, the U.S. is pretty much doing as well. That's not the issue. The issue is poverty. That is the primary explanation. Because when you look at low-income schools, what you see is low. In Sweden, I mean, in, in much of Europe, Schools with poorer kids actually get extra resources. And here they get less in this country, almost always. One of the exceptions was New Jersey. Highest graduation rate in the country for years. Quite high test scores. Um, and they put a lot of extra money into the poorest districts. They're soon to depart, thank you, good, thank you very much, Governor Christie has tried to dismantle that repeatedly with only partial success, so it mostly stays. Um, but New Jersey was a total outlier on this. Massachusetts did fairly well for a while, but the funding has fallen apart, and we've seen stagnation in the test scores and widening gaps. So huge amounts of this is based on simply poverty, the unwillingness of this country to take care of poverty, to issues like health care and housing that are taken care of at least much better in many other countries, and it explains it. So ESSA comes along, and we now see um, some changes and of course, we've also seen the resistance. And those are my next two topics. So real quickly, what ESSA says is they got the same amount of testing, but they add <clears throat> how you do it. So you got to have your basic scores, but you also got to have what's called a growth measure, uh, a progress indicator. And in most states, like Oregon, is using student growth percentiles or value added. And essentially, that's the same tests, only it's measuring the, in the gain in scores versus your actual absolute scores. ELL progress, so English language learners, this is a new thing, intended to make sure you pay more attention to English language learners because you don't have to count it in accountability. And in Oregon, it's the ELPA 21, and they use the student growth percentiles. Literally, it says, or they'll use something similar. They haven't yet settled it in Oregon. And graduation rates for high school. Um, they're looking in Oregon only at the four-year cohort, although ESSA allows five- and six-year cohorts, which means schools set up to help kids who have dropped out and who are behind are under the eight ball from day one in Oregon. So that's not a good sign. Um, they, have, they cover it later under this other category. I would note that if a school does not graduate 67% or more of its students, it becomes one of their uh, comprehensive support and intervention schools, i.e. failing in the old parlance. Um, that's all, all of that together has to count for more than half, and in most states count for 75 and 80% of the weight that's going to be given in evaluating schools. Now, that's different, at least, from just the standardized test scores, which is pretty much what everybody did with some very small weighting for high school graduation. Now, schools have to use one or more school quality indicators, which, again, has to be less than half the weight. Oregon only picked one, chronic absenteeism. It seems to be quite possibly the most common one in the country, although I don't know that for a fact yet. We're still investigating that. High schools judge on ninth grade academic achievement and five-year high school completion rate, so it adds that. This carries some weight. I don't know the weight it carries in Oregon, probably in the 15 20% range, um, given how few measures they are. And you've got to disaggregate disaggregate all this by the famous subgroups, blacks, Latinos, kids with disabilities, English language learners, poor kids. 
And then you evaluate the schools. It requires ESSA to rank the schools. Or not really. You don't have to rank every school in the state and put it out there. That's actually not required. What's required under ESSA is that you identify the comprehensive support and improvement schools and the targeted intervention schools. But Oregon is choosing to sort out your schools on five levels, not three, because you can take that, if you're not one of these two, targeted or comprehensive, that's everybody else in the state. You're here, you're talking somewhere between 5% and 10% of the schools. So 90%, you could have in one big category. No. What they're doing in Massachusetts is going from five to six. Why? As far as I can tell, it's to get the suburbs fighting with each other for higher test scores. Um, makes the realtors happy. Um, in, in Oregon, their growth and graduation rates are rated more heavily than in some other places. OK. Now, <clears throat> comprehensive support and intervention and, and support and improvement. That is the bottom 5% based on all those indicators I ran through. You put them all together, and it's the bottom 5%. It is still mostly test scores. So that's going to tell you who it's your worst. And we know that's going to almost certainly identify low-income schools. That's just how this system is structured with the test scores. And they probably have lower graduation rates mostly because the kids are desperate. The school systems are under-resourced, under -resource, et cetera, et cetera. And they leave more often. The kids in the suburbs stay in school. Very few of them drop out. So they're already going to look better. Chronic absenteeism. Guaranteed where it's worse. It's with the kids who got to stay home to take care of their younger brother. It's the kids who don't get health care and are sick and stay home. It's the parents who are working three jobs who can't deal with it, or et cetera. And they're going to be more chronic absenteeism kids. It's good to identify and do something about it, but you see they're going to rate the schools on it. And I think schools should do something about it. But it's, it's a, we have to look at whether that's going to play out well in a moment. The other is targeted intervention. And essentially, those are schools where <coughs> You're in a school, and you've got a, sub, a so-called subgroup, i.e. blacks, Latinos, ELL, et cetera, whose, at, whose score is at or below the level of the lowest 5% overall in the state. So uh, you look at that, those scores at the lowest scoring in the state. And if you've got a group of black kids in your school that score at or below that, you have targeted intervention, which means you're supposed to do something for those kids. They should. Maybe those kids really need help. So the question then becomes, what is actually going to happen? We know under, under NCLB, the requirements were fire the principal, fire the half or more of the teachers, turn it over to a charter operator, privatize it, close it down completely, or let the state run it. I mean, those were the choices. You had to do one of those things. None of that is in the Oregon plan. The feds require none of that anymore. And that is the single biggest change in, in ESSA. It simply does not require you to be punitive. Oregon actually seems to have learned from this reasonably well. We will have to see how it plays out in the real world. But essentially what they're saying is if a school is in that, bottom, in that 5%, in that low performing crew, or the high school that doesn't graduate enough, the district can act on its own to devise a plan, or the district can get technical support, bring in an outsider and work with them, or they can enact a state comprehensive. That is, a state's going to have a model that you can use instead, which may or may not fit your school. So, but you can do it at the district. So if Eugene, undoubtedly, with lots of poor people, is going to have uh, some schools in that category, it's up to the district then could choose to take the lead in improving it. And when they do that, they're supposed to do it together with the teachers in the building, some parents, some outside community people, to come up with a plan to how to make the school better and implement and monitor that plan to see if there's progress. If there's a lack of progress, the state says there will be more intense support or intervention, but there won't be takeovers, closures, and everything else. Yes? That was the question. I just wanted to have you say it again, that ESSA doesn't require, and Oregon is now committing to not doing school takeovers, because that never really happened in the past. But it's always out there as a rumor and is used to intimidate parents into taking the test. And in a lot of places, you had principals fired. And a lot of places, remember, there was a famous one, Central Falls, Rhode Island, the poorest town and the only state in New England that's really kind of a poor state, Rhode Island. The poorest town in a relatively poor state 
was doing poorly, and they fired all the teachers, and they were jumping up and down in Washington about how under Obama, about how wonderful this was. Um, that no longer, now Massachusetts is going to keep doing this stuff, by the way. That's in the Massachusetts plan. We are one of the most benighted states in the country on accountability. I hate to say it. Okay. Also, don't need to judge teachers by test scores. I mentioned that earlier. It's local. Your district could choose to do that, but you can get them to not do that. The state leaves it up to the locals. Okay. The extent can, so, a state can keep the NCLB type sanctions. A state can help rather than publish, publish, then punish. I think Oregon's a bit toward the middle, but really mostly on the help side. Now, again, whether the help will be good remains to be seen. And whether the districts, if they take charge, will listen to the actual educators and the parents in the community or ram something through with a hand-picked group of people and act like, here we go, we'll bring in this new package test program and we'll raise the test scores and everybody will be happy, even though it's lousy, lousy education. See, this is still, but at least we can now fight about it. We couldn't even fight about it before. Before it was like written in stone in the federal law. If you take Title I money, and who's going to give that up? It's a lot of money in a lot of poor districts. And if you take it, you had to go through all of that crazy crap. So you don't have to do it anymore. So what we're saying is the state can take advantage of the ESSA changes because of the very changed accountability. And what that means is you can cut the district mandate. It's easier to cut the district mandated tests because they're not going to come in and close you down. They're not going to fire people. They're not. They promised they weren't going to do it. So don't worry. Ask for help. What the heck? Fight to make sure that it's help that's going to really be helpful. Ask those questions. What do we really want from our schools? How do we design a program to get it? How do we need indicators to tell us whether we're doing well? We're stuck with the test, but what else do we want to know? And build a different kind of a process. Because over the long haul, engaged students who care will produce better test scores than disengaged students who get drilled all the time. It's just everybody's afraid. Massive fear. And you get mass, and it's understandable, but it freezes the brain. No fear is not a good way to think creatively and critically. It, a little bit of stimulation, OK, but real fear, uh-uh. It freezes, it paralyzes. And that's what we've seen, a lot of paralyzing. So I mean, block those stupid computerized packages any way you can. Don't let that take over your schools. It will be awful for the kids and the teachers, in my view. Implement teacher-determined student-focused performance assessment. There are some places doing that um, here in Oregon. But <clears throat> the feds allow this thing called the Innovative Assessment Option. It's a pilot program, seven states. You, during it, any school that's in your pilot, as you build toward a new statewide system, can cut back to testing once each in elementary, middle, and high school, and can even use sampling instead of testing every kid. That's allowed under ESSA. You can do locally determined, locally based assessing, as long as you can establish comparability. So the score, the, 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 the determination of who's proficient, as it were, in those other categories in Portland and Eugene and Salem and everywhere else is kind of comparable. That is, it means roughly enough, closely enough the same thing. New Hampshire did one. They got a pilot. It's actually now in its fourth year. Half the districts in the state are either doing it or in preparation learning to do it. Um, the state tests all students in grades 4, 8, and 11. They didn't go to sampling why that wasn't an option. They got a waiver under No Child Left Behind from Arnie Duncan. Um, <clears throat> instead, they create what's called common tasks read by teachers. They spend a lot of time on this. Um, those are used to help calibrate across the participating districts. The teachers who do that go back to their districts and help teachers learn to write tasks, and those are administered, and that's a core part of an end-of-the-year teacher-made competency determination, which is equivalent, really, to a grade. They get you, are you proficient, are you not yet proficient, whatever those terminologies are, sort you out on three, on their, it's going to have to now be four levels in New Hampshire. Some districts were doing three. And New Hampshire allows you to do it on your own standards or use the state ones, or their, your own competency description, or use the state ones. Have to all be based on the standards, which are common core. And this decision is based on a body of evidence that includes these local tasks. 
and then to make sure that it's comparable, they use the smarter balance scores, the common test, the local cost, and they say, are they in sync with this teacher-determined competency evaluation? And the first-year evidence showed that, yep, it was consistent and reliable across the state. It can be done. We already knew it could be done. It's been done in other countries. But you have to figure out a, a way to do it. And you have to check it and you have to monitor because that's what the feds require. So what could happen is actually even broader than what New Hampshire did. Under ESSA, they're actually more flexible now. You can have a system of local systems. They have this language about it. It can't be local systems. That's because it has to be state calibrated. That's what it means when you read the read through and put the pieces together. You can have a system of local systems if you can establish statewide comparability. You can have the local educators design and build each local system, or you can do it across districts, whatever. All of that's OK. You don't have to have common local tasks. You could instead use a common scoring guide across the state, a rubric, instead of common tasks. Or you can use a mix of the two. Nobody I know has figured out an alternative way. So you're going to have to do one of those two while you build the system. And you have to have that local evidence, and you have to go through some process that's statistically verifiable to say that the kids in these different districts, when we say they're proficient, it means basically the same thing. And they studied it in New Hampshire, as I said, and did it. Now, um, an example that New Hampshire won, the New York Performance Standards Consortium, I do want to talk about it for a minute because it's nearly 50 schools now. They're almost all in New York City. They demographically mirror New York City by race, class, language, disability, except the average kid going into these schools has lower test scores. They apply and get into these schools the same way they do every other school in the city, except the ones you have to have high test scores to get into. And the results of this system are the kids do much better. The system is that to graduate, yes? I just wanted to clarify. When they enter the school, they have, they have lower test, test scores. We don't know about, I mean, they have to take the English language arts graduate uh, high school exam, and they have to pass it. There are four other New York State tests. They don't have to take any of them, and they don't. Uh, the English language is the safest one in that there's no content. It's all about writing and reading. And so, you know, the kids learn, they do a lot of writing and reading in these schools. And I'll, you'll see why in a minute. And so mostly they don't have trouble with this test. That's not the issue for them. Um, they may not score real high, and I don't know how well they do on test scores. Deb Meyer said of her schools, yeah, the test scores go up, but not by much. But the kids learn to succeed. And then this is the other outcome. So what they go through is they have to show four performance-based assessment tests. These are in-depth investigations. They lead to things like 20-page research papers. Okay, um, And that's what they do, which means they are ready for college. Now, I've talked about this with high school kids in Boston, and they go, Boy, that sounds like an awful lot of work. But it said, this is what you do. You're not taking standardized tests. You're working collaboratively. And they scaffold it through your, your, your years of high schooling. Because remember, these kids come in with test prep schooling in New York. For out of poor, low-income schools in New York, it's test prep teaching. They, most of them, not all of them. And they come in, and they have to learn this stuff. It's actually gotten harder for the teachers because the whole test prep control has gotten worse. But they learn to do this. So it's scaffolded. You know, first you write a short paper, a book report. Then you write a longer one. Then you learn the critical analysis tools. And you learn to compare different learners. And you build the capacity so that by the end, you're reading a serious adult novel, and you're writing a lengthy paper about it. And you're defending it in front of a committee. That's your lead teacher in the subject, somebody from outside the school who's an expert, and one person who could be from outside the school or inside the school, another teacher. Okay, And they do that. Um, and I've seen them. And you hear things like Rockefeller University, it's a research university with nothing but grad students. And the person from the biology department there said, these students understand how to do science better than many of my grad students. They don't have the content knowledge. They're high school kids. But they learn how to think and reason science. The, de the chair of the history department at Columbia said, we need to use this process at Columbia. Okay, This is the kind of stuff. the kids. Graduate in higher percentages, double the rates for English language learners and students with disabilities. Still lower than it should be. They know it, I know it, but double the city rate. Higher for blacks, higher for Latinos. They go to college at higher than city average rates among the high school graduates. And they've studied them into their third semester in college. And they're up there with the national averages of steps, persistence in college, despite the fact they're mostly poor kids. 
And we know lots of people don't stay in college. Why? Because they don't have the money, not because they can't do the work. And these students will tell you, the other thing that they can do is they can talk to adults. Why? They do seminars. They talk to adults all the time. They have to negotiate what their projects are. They have to work with them as person to person. And they learn. So when they have a problem, they go talk to the professor. They know how to form study groups and work together. These are the kind of things they also learn. So these are others in a report called Assessment Matters at fairtest.org. We have a search this website, put that in, it's there, or use the drop-down menu for public schools, it's there. And these are all examples of different, see the International Baccalaureate is a much more standardized operation, but there's some fairly extensive and serious performance stuff in it. It's not my favorite, but you know, I love the New York Performance Standards Consortium. I love this little school in New Hampshire that's doing much more creative stuff than what the state as a whole is doing, so they don't even want to participate in it, but they will down the road. Right now they do the smarter balance, they're not worried, they're wealth, you know, they're middle class school, nobody's going to hurt them, they don't care about the test scores. The kids, literally the teachers say, oh yeah, the kids flag all these items as bad items, incoherent, no right answer, wrong, you know, all this stuff that the kids know is wrong. You know, kids do, at this school, kids do critical thinking. I'll just mention, I mentioned earlier more of them, I'm going to pick one now. After I watched a showcase of, of younger kids and the, the fourth, fifth, the fifth, sixth graders, it's a K-6 school. And <clears throat> the principal said, we're going to do inquiry-based learning if you hire me. And if you don't want to do that, don't hire me. She had left education because she couldn't stand to teach to the test. They really tracked her down and offered this to her. And one of the things outside the, the, the fifth, sixth grade classroom, they multi-age, was a list of topic items all clearly about social sciences. And one of them said KKK. And I'm like, hmm, what does this kid want to know about KKK? What's up here? And the teacher saw me looking and we talked about it and he said, this KKK, the student wants to know how can you repress the KKK without infringing on civil liberties? Now that's a serious question. For a fifth, sixth grader, for a high school student, for a college student, for us adults, you know, all of that is serious. So these are other examples. Now, the new path to Oregon, I'm not going to go into this right now. I'm happy to answer questions. Essentially, there's a lot of stuff coming up, particularly what I have not dwelt on, which is high quality teacher assessment. They worked a lot with Rich Stiggins. Rich's main thing in Curry's career was formative assessment and how teachers can be good at assessing. Because let's face it, what did you learn about assessing? Well, you went to public schools, not much. You went to college and got trained to be a teacher. The evidence is not much. If you learned anything, it was how to interpret standardized tests, and maybe not even that. You didn't learn to do good classroom, good classroom assessment. So if you learned it, it was for some other reason. How do you build that systematically so teachers teach each other and you build it up? That was Rich's main preoccupation, as it were. And so it's a big part of that. And we heard earlier tonight from a woman where they're doing it at, I don't remember the name of the school. What's that? Centennial Elementary. Centennial in, in Springfield and another school in the area. They started doing this stuff on a pilot basis, um, which is great. Um, periodic evidence supplied by progress monitoring. That's what New Hampshire is doing. That's what we talked about. An interim benchmark test, no, that's a problem. I disagree with them about that. I would encourage you not to do that. Rely on the evidence that teachers compile and students compile in the classroom. It will tell you what you need to know, including whether or not it's a rigorous curriculum. If it's a junk curriculum, you'll see junk samples of work. You can't expect critical thinking out of worksheets. And if they, all that's in their folder is a bunch of worksheets, you know that the teaching is no good. And it has to be dealt with. Results of annual assessments. OK, you got smarter balance. You're stuck with it. You don't have to have that. You do need to have annual evidence. I have no argument about that at all. How are our schools doing is something that everybody deserves to know. And the civil rights groups have supported a lot of this test-driven stuff because they want an answer to that. And I did meet with a lot of them and said, if we had a system like New Hampshire, which was already existing, if we built that, if we could trust the comparability, would that be OK? And they went, yes. But you see, they don't trust that politically that's winning. So, but they went along with putting that language into ESSA. They didn't fight it. They weren't happy about it because they don't trust it. And I think they made too far in that direction. All right, so this is, I asked you those questions again at the beginning. So when you want to change stuff, these are, these are conversations communities need to have. Because it also opens the door to thinking about how to make change. It brings people in. I've sat on these in different kinds of communities, from wealthy to poor to inner city to suburbs, blah, blah, blah. And they're all highly similar. 
inner city kids want portfolios and future parents want portfolios and projects. I've heard them say so. They want to know in-depth work. They want creativity. They want critical thinking. They want to make sure that their kids learn those basic skills and they are right to want that because everybody wants that for their kids. But they want a lot more than that. And it's important to begin to structure the system around it. Then you got to organize. You got to end punitive accountability. Oregon has largely done that. You just have to make sure it's real and it happens. You got to overhaul the district and the school assessments. We have some pilots. There's more room to do that. The local assessments is a basis for a statewide system. If a bunch of districts start doing that, you will be in position to show it can work and begin to pressure the state, which I'm told is run for stand on top of children, um, as, as what's going on now. But be that as it may, Anywhere you go, this stuff is political fights. It's what is. And build a new statewide system. That is, of course, a goal. Along with other things like adequately funding the schools, um, obviously need to happen. So here are some campaigns and victories recently. I mentioned the state graduate actually was 26. Well, since 2012, since almost all the cuts have happened in five years. The 26 number, someone cut it before that. Um, Cutbacks in the number of tests to the amount of test time, mostly in districts in some states. So we have a report coming out next week. It'll be on the homepage of fairtest.org. You'll be able to click right on it. And it's about a whole bunch of these victories that have been winning. We've been winning. More cutbacks in the graduation test. Diplomas made retroactive in states that had them, like California. Someone said earlier today 38,000 so far they have handed out of diplomas to people who did all their work, except they didn't pass the test. Unfortunately, it doesn't count all the people who got discouraged and left before completing all their other work. They're on, the, they're on the prison pipeline job and the poverty level, most of them, too many of them. Um, but the cutbacks are, most of these, we look at seven districts. And that the districts we looked at are um, <clears throat> Santa Fe and Las Cruces, New Mexico, San Diego and Sacramento, California. Um, we looked at St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, Jefferson County, Kentucky, which is Louisville, and Knox County, Tennessee, Knoxville on the edge of Appalachia. They all have lots of poor, poor kids. Um, Knoxville may not have too many kids of color. I don't know. Everybody else does. Lots of immigrants. Lots of immigrants in most of these communities. And so this is organizing by, led by the, in all of the cases we do are teacher-led ones, but there are some that have been led by the community people as well that we have talked about in other times and places. These are all districts that are part of the National Council of Urban Education Associations, which is why I'm there. I've been in working with them. They mostly started this before we were involved. Um, but we're helping move them along. We've got a survey that's available to use. Surveys are a good tool, by the way, because not only do you get information like, what do teachers think about all this testing? They help you start talking and organizing. They're a good organizing tool. And many of the districts used it as both gathering the info and organizing. The one state that won putting a cap on the amount of time on testing, they used a survey to expose the fact that districts were lying to the state about how much testing they did. And also the legislators believed their survey. And it was very influential to the state, state legislators. legislators. Yes? The state legislators have told me that they need to hear from people who have either criticisms or endorsements of specific uh, ideas. And they, uh, we also need to take the opportunity to speak to the new deputy superintendent, uh, Colt Gill, who is, at the moment, his window is open. I'm meeting with Colt tomorrow. Hopefully, I will help. Thursday, Marty. Thursday. It doesn't matter to me. You're, dri you're driving me. I don't know. I just get up and go. Um, reduce the test and teacher evaluation, not so much an issue in Oregon. Uh, opting out. So opting out is, a, is, is something that has built in Oregon. The, the, the biggest site in the country for that, as we know, is New York, where even with an incredible pushback, they maintained a 20% plus opt-out rate, 50% on Long Island. It's treated as, as all middle class suburbs. In fact, some of the communities on Long Island with 50% opt-out rates and more are largely communities of color. And they have worked hard, in the, the organizers worked hard. They translated everything, in, particularly into Spanish. They've been in those communities. There are activist parents in those communities who are of those communities. Um, so yes, it's, it is predominantly middle class. And middle, there's a reason. You go to New York City where there hasn't been so much of an opt out. Why? Well, they use test scores to decide what middle school you go to. Many middle schools have the option of deciding who to accept and they use test scores. 
What is it, why? Well, it guarantees they're going to have good test scores because test scores beget test scores. So parents want to get their kids into those schools. So they're not going to say, don't take the test. They've got a few of those schools to say, we won't look at the test, but that did not succeed. And the scare tactics have been immense. And the scare tactics are real common. I know you've seen them. You won't get, we'll lose all our Title I money. Lie from day one. Not one district has ever lost a nickel due to test scores. And there's nothing in the law that would allow it other than a declaration that the entire state is out of compliance and will no longer get Title I money. And that's never happened, and it isn't going to happen because all hell would break loose in Congress if they tried. So they're not going to do it. So this is, so anyway, so the opting out. Um, now the flip side of this is they haven't won much in New York. You know, at the very beginning, they want to end, they got rid of kindergarten testing. And they put a cap on the amount of time on testing, but nobody enforces it. It's one of the problems with caps. I don't think they're terribly effective. Um, they may become more effective because ESSA now requires every district and every school to post once a year all the standardized tests they're going to administer. So use that tool. It's in the law, federal law. Um, and it doesn't say only if you get Title I money, as far as I know. It's not in those sections. I think it's, it's simply a requirement. So demand it. And that, because then you can say how much crazy amount, and you can use that evidence. So surveys are useful. But now the info's got to be produced as part of Title I requirements, federal law. Then you can use, a, I mean, audits, rather. You used to do audits. NEA was really pushing audits. Try to get that info. Now the feds say you have to do it. So you've got to check on it. But a survey is a good way to check on it because you list all the ones the state say, you know, do you use that in your grade, blah, blah, blah. Is it useful? Is it not useful, et cetera. But you can also say any other tests because they may be lying. Or they may not, literally not know in the central office. And the other problem is schools may add on top of what the district requires. We see this more commonly, once again, in schools serving poor kids. You know, they get more of a test driven. So the district may not paying attention and the Jones School has added, you know, another battery of tests every six weeks or something. And they don't even know at the district office, maybe. But the teachers know. So getting that. So the opting out, you know, they haven't been able to turn it into legislative clout. And the places where there's been more legislative clout, you have to look at what are the characteristics. It requires a governor that will sign legislation. Students in California led a statewide campaign that won a bill through the legislature to end their state graduation test. And they did it when Schwarzenegger was governor, except he vetoed it. And they couldn't override his veto. Okay? They have passed bills in New Jersey, except <clears throat> the chair of the Senate Education Committee didn't want to approve it, even though it had passed overwhelmingly to get rid of the high school graduation test in the House. And the sentiment clearly was overwhelmingly in favor in the Senate. She blocked it from happening. Somebody else blocked it the next year. And the governor was there saying he was going to veto it. And it was clear the Republicans weren't going to cross him. Um, in California, they ended up with a veto-proof majority. But Governor Brown was in favor of getting rid of the graduation test. So one of his good things, Jerry's in a mixed bag. But on that, he was good. And they had no problem getting rid of it. Um, but they didn't have that veto-proof majority when Schwarzenegger was governor. So these things like the governor, the whoever runs the Senate, whoever runs the House or the Assembly, the chairs of the committees, they all have to line up. Oh, you're probably not going to get something passed. It'll be real hard to get something passed. I mean, they were getting thousands and thousands of calls and emails and everybody on all the, in New Jersey. They organized very, very well. And they had a strong opt-out movement. Uh, for one year when it seemed that the graduation test was not really going to count and nobody cared, and they had a 15% opt-out rate in high school, then they clamped down and said, no, 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 it's going to count. And of course, the graduate opt-out in high school really declined. And they haven't really pushing it as much in Jersey. How to translate this stuff legislatively is basic legislative organizing. You know, how do you translate grassroots energy? Without the grassroots energy, it's unlikely to happen for a lot of this stuff. The graduation tests have been interesting. They have mostly not been on a grassroots basis. There's been other reasons. We talk about it in our report, some of the reasons. 
But most of this stuff will change because of grassroots effort, and that means, if possible, the unions. And you may have to win the union over. Now, I mentioned in some of these districts, and I'm going to end with this, in Knox County, in Santa Fe, in Las Cruces, for sure. I'm not certain about some of the other districts. In Knox County, it took them three elections to go from no support to seven or eight of nine school board members that support them. In Las Cruces, it took them a couple of elections. In Santa Fe, these are places that won a majority on the school board. What happened then? Well, in Knox County, the superintendent resigned. I think in some of the others, they bought him out. And they brought in a super who supported less testing. And so those districts have ended any non-state testing mandates. Now, what does that mean? Well, in Las Cruces, it's up to, which is a heavily Latino community, but it has white people and it has a class system like every other community. And so in particularly the lower income, heavily immigrant schools, there's still a lot more of the testing because it's up to the principal. And you have a lot of teachers that get dependent on this stuff. We like the MAP test. They did a study of the MAP test outside of Chicago, and they found it had no correlation whatsoever with scores and changes in scores on the state test. It was not useful for it. But people get dependent on this. At any rate, the, the super this fall um, at their annual gathering of all the principals, in the fall gathering of all the principals, he said, they do it quarterly, he said, we're going to, we need to move away from your reliance on these standardized tests. And we don't want you making more standardized tests on your own in the schools. You've got to think about better ways. You can work together, but you've got to do something other than imitation standardized tests at the, the school level. We've got to get into the deeper kinds of stuff. Now, that's a set of other things. It's professional development. It's time for teachers to collaborate. And the super in Santa Fe said, our big problem is we've got to find time for teachers to collaborate so they can learn each other. And it's about the curriculum, of course. It's about instructional methods. It's all of that as a package. But it can be learned. I lied. It wasn't my last thing. My last thing is, a, is, a, is actually a good and bad story. In the state of Nebraska, before the No Child Left Behind, under the federal law that says you have to give statewide tested grades four, eight, and once in elementary, once in middle, and once in high. That's all you have to do. And they ended the norm reference test requirements that had been in ESEA before. And the, led by the state super, Doug Christensen, they decided to create a system of local systems. They weren't concerned about comparability. They did say they had to be anchored in the state standards, or you could have district standards as long as you can show they're at least as good as the state standards. They have to be unbiased. They have to be valid. They have to be reliable. They have to prove these kinds of things that test makers do. And they had a set of standards for the assessments. And they turned the districts loose. I went out to be invited out to keynote their annual, but for a while, annual. Uh, conference on assessment. And it was an auditorium with, I don't know, five, four, five, six hundred teachers actually interested in a positive way about assessment. Never seen anything like it, pretty much before or since. I walked around the auditorium before I was to speak, and people had come in from schools, districts, and had set up district examples. And what I noticed, what was typical, was, for example, one, and the others were very similar, they had multiple choice and matching tests. They had proved they were as technical, technically reliable as what you could buy from CTB McGraw-Hill, you know, 90% plus reliability. Didn't measure much. And then they had samples of student work that was projects. They were look, they look good. Nothing like earth shattering, but they were good projects, reasonable. And I said, you know, what you need is for those projects to be your assessment. And I got a huge round of applause. And Doug was, that's exactly what they needed to hear. I went back out a year later. And my joke, of course, it was due to one line I said from a stage. But of course, it wasn't. That's what everybody was showing. They had moved in one year to looking at projects as their assessment for their piece of the state system. There is a real good book. I remembered his name, Chris Gallagher. I couldn't remember this morning. A guy named Chris Gallagher wrote a book came, called Reclaiming Assessment. And it was about the Nebraska thing. He was in charge of the evaluation of the Nebraska system. 
Why did it die? No child left behind. Rod Page and his department wouldn't approve it. And they went back and forth and back and forth. And they finally got Rod Page to come out. And they took him around to schools. And he talked to teachers. And he said, he told Doug, he said, you know, this is what, NCA, and this is what No Child Left Behind should be. Who would know? And then he resigned. And Margaret Spellings came in. And she was a steel clad over a cement wall. Nothing was going to change. And she had allies in the state. And there was a group of them that pushed through legislation. And the story I heard essentially is they bribed wavering legislators because they have a unicameral, so you didn't have to even do two houses. It's harder to block. And they bribed them with all these goodies for their districts and got them to get rid of it and put in a new state test, single standardized test. But what we noticed was this real flowering where teachers had to do this. And the most interesting part of Chris's book to me was about how the teachers learned to work together in the schools. And to really think about, because it meant thinking about the curriculum. It meant thinking about how they worked with each other. It meant thinking about the students in a different way. And they steadily were building the system. Boots. They had no extra money. They had to figure out how they were going to arrange the time. So that meant sometimes paying teachers some more out of whatever. But they had to arrange the time for the teachers to do it. It was part of their job. The teachers' union supported it. They went to the legislature to try to defend it. It was supported by the teachers. Oh, every teacher in the state? Probably not. But by and large, it supported them. It made a difference on Indian reservations. It started a different relationship between the, there's a study of one Indian reservation, a different relationship between the school and its community, which was heavily impoverished. All the things you hear about reservations were going on, all the negative things. But it helped make changes. So this stuff actually, as you begin to think about it, what do our kids need to know and do? What's the relationship with the community? Who do we want our children to become? Isn't that what we need to look at how our schools can help that happen? And if so, how do we, know, how do we help it happen? And how do we know it's happening? Thank you. Um, to go ahead. Yes, so your question. Thank you. Um, my name's Nancy Lise. We can't do anything more. We are so focused on the test scores. We, we can't do anything. And so I'm basically, frankly, well, or you know, you know. You know, there's a school, all the testing mania creates an unhealthy climate at school. It's hyper competitive, it's hyper stressed out. It puts people who might be, well, might be inclined, puts them in a worse situation. Yes. And more aggregate, there's more endangering. Um, now, you know, bullying pre-exists testing just like bad teaching pre-exists right. testing, you know. But testing makes it all worse. And the high stakes nature is really what makes it all worse. And so to the extent that you can now move away from the high stakes because the stakes are much less, you now have more room. So reinforcing that with them, making it very clear you're there to help and there will be not punishment, and that encouraging don't go down the road of extra testing. Don't go. If the state would send those signals, it will help. It won't solve it. I mean, the solution requires rethinking about a school that meets the needs of the whole child. That's all about those things I was talking about, what we really want from schools. It may mean using real restorative practices. And those a lot are like, a lot of the restorative practices out there are pretty crummy. They're not serious. Uh, some teacher gets assigned to put two kids together and talk it out. It, that's not what it is. Um, but deep restorative circles are really tra can transform the culture of a school because the youth are in charge, and the youth then have a stake in the in the emotional social climate of the school, and that affects. But again, you got to bring this stuff kind of into balance, as you said. It is a smarter balance. I wouldn't advise using that word because it's been kind of corrupted. But you know, it is both smarter and, and in a sense, balanced. And that's possible. So I, I, you know, there is a compatibility here that's important to talk about well, from both ends. The realize that that's what I'm going to be working cool. on here. Okay, good. Anyway, yes. Nancy. So, respect for learning, but I don't know how to solve the problem of, of equity, of fairness in assessment, and the limits of full time. And well, again, the New York Consortium is a good example. It can be done. They don't have extra money. They got a little money to run the consortium, some grants. That's mostly been very thin. 
They don't get more money for the schools. They get the same money that everybody else gets in New York City. It was a commitment on the part of the educators. Now, what, at most of the schools, to my knowledge, take a half day and send the kids out to internships. Take a college course, work at a hospital, a nonprofit, or this or that, okay? That's for which they have a mentor, and they, they get, um, it's part of their schoolwork. In that half day, the teachers work together on whatever they're going to work together. Um, you know, the issues are long term. It's not, that's not news. I've been teaching that since I started teaching. But we don't commit to it. But here's, that's fine. That's then you know. But you have to, but there is no other solution. Look, if I was trying to argue back in 1994 when they were reauthorizing ESEA for the system to move toward portfolios and stuff, I couldn't get anywhere. Oh, we're not ready for it. You know what happened in 1994 if we said, let's do something like Finland? Okay, we know we haven't, we know there's no will for a social welfare system that's really the bigger problem. Yeah. Okay? You don't get equity when everybody from minute, but from pre birth on is treated inequitably. You don't get equity. It doesn't happen. You don't get it in health. You don't get it in money. You don't get it in education. It's a myth. But you can do a lot better in education. And what I tried to say with the New York Consortium is you, people in the real world, in this city of New York, are doing it. Those kids, many of them, far out of predicted proportions, are succeeding in college. And the teachers put it together and they do it. If we had said back in 94, let's go down that road of really trying to develop a much stronger teaching force that works collaboratively, we might end up in a very different place. Instead, they waffled on that. You had Nebraska doing something. You had most states not doing much of anything in there. You did have a bunch of states starting to try to do performance assessment. There was progress in that area across a number of states in the 1990s. Then there was a late 90s recession that killed some states. They didn't put any more money into it. It was withdrawn, and that hurt. But more than that, you then had no child left behind. Wiped out a whole lot of stuff right off the top. And then we went down the wrong road. So now we have to claw our way back. And it's going to be harder because now we have the, not only the entrenched testing regime, we now have those fabulously wealthy hedge funders and all that love to use test results to sell privatizing schools. Okay, so your issues are real, but they're, they're, it's like there is no magic anything. It is more, what New York shows is this method can be more equitable because it's producing better results for the kids who most need that help. It doesn't solve everything. Those schools need more money. They have kids who don't get the health care they need. All the rest of it remains true. And to the extent we're taking one piece of it and trying to make it better, these are some things that can be done. Nebraska, I brought up the Nebraska one because those teachers did it with no extra money. They organized how to have more time within the school day so that teachers could work together. And the trade-offs are real. You might say, okay, we'll have our, all our specials done and all the rest of the core teachers will get to collaborate. And of course, that's unfair. It's not a good solution, but it's better than no solution. And after a while, maybe we can figure out something else that's even better. Roscoe was telling me earlier in his middle school, they rearranged the schedule of the school day to create more time for teachers to collaborate, okay? And to be more student-centered in the process, use that same schedule to focus on how to be more student-centered and how to allow more teacher collaboration, which are things that go hand in hand. You find these kinds of things. You have to be then willing to try to do it at the local level. We know there'll be a bunch of failure. And we know the system is basically stacked against us. But the resistance to the testing, the questioning of this stuff, all of those, the movies out there about the, the, the testing mania and the, um, you know, the pressure to do better and better and better and better and what that's doing to kids, that stuff is circulating more and more and more. We're in a position now, I think, where we have the public for the most part. We actually have the public. They don't know they have it. We have, they don't know. They just... When you ask them in a survey now, by large percentages, every demographic group thinks there's too much testing and it's having harmful effects. Where the hell are the policymakers? It's a question of how you organize. And when you're organizing, where they were effective, they put this issue as what's good for kids. They didn't go in there and say, we as teachers, we need more time. They didn't go in there and say, we hate the test, it's for, you know, change it for us. They said, this is why it's bad for your kids. 
and they persuaded the communities because the communities now kind of get it. Our side has won that deep messaging, but we haven't yet found a sufficient way to translate it into political victories because the politicos are behind thinking because the politicos bought into testing is good and support stuff and because they get a lot of money from hedge funders and such. Okay, so you put those men, and it's difficult, but the organizing is the way, and that's why we were looking at these districts. You know, in West Virginia, in Knoxville, the governor, in this little town, nobody spent money on school board races. He put $50,000 into the school board races to fight the union parent back slate, and lost. And lost. You know, so, you know, now they have one, they get, they got rid of the testing that the state doesn't require. State, unfortunately, requires a bunch of additional testing besides what the feds require, but at least the district got rid of their extra. So, and it doesn't mean they all know how suddenly to, to do good assessment or deep, you know, student-engaged curriculum. They don't know, that doesn't fall from the sky. But you have to clear the, you know, you have to clear the, the poisonous vines out before you can grow the fruit and vegetables. The Oregon Department of Education and the Oregon Education Association both offer grants for performance-based assessment. It just doesn't seem to be very well known. And um, the other point that I thought was kind of interesting was I was reading a letter by uh, our former superintendent, Deputy Superintendent Salon Noor, and it was part of the ESSA plan. And parents ranked assessment and accountability as the fourth most important. And when he went to describe the Oregon ESSA plan, Assessment was the first thing that he described. So it is really difficult for um, our system to break out of this mold, no matter what parents say. So we just have to keep pushing back. So you see maybe one or two more questions. One or two more questions. Sure. Go ahead. Um, we need to get to the universities where we have them, and we need to use them and talk to them and have them help us be a moving force legislatively in our states. If you can Austin get them. is a good example of one university president really making a movement with others happen. Um, there's actually, I mean, Leon's good. He's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Bart, uh, um, Bowdoin College and Bates College, Bates yes. especially, were much more important in that, in the effort. Mm -hmm. Because they really went, they were one of the first colleges to drop the SAT, ACT requirements, and they are one of the top ranked and have been for a long, both of them, among the top 10, 20 small private liberal arts colleges. And they sort of led the push. Fair Test has a list right on our website of nearing 1,000 colleges that do not require the SAT or the ACT for most or all applicants. And we asterisk if there's a, you know, this or that exception to that. A few of them, that, uh, very few demand some other kind of test score. Some of them might be in-state only, like with state colleges. Some, especially the state one colleges, again, as a GPA thing, if it's high enough, and so on. But by and large, this is like, clearly they don't care. Now, there are quite a few state colleges, but I think virtually no, if any, flagship universities that have dropped the test scores. The Ivies haven't dropped the test scores. Um, a small but growing number of leading research in universities have dropped them, but it's been a much slower process. With the state schools, it's part simply they don't have the money. So they use test scores to weed out half the applicants like that, or whatever proportion they're going to get rid of, um, and accept a bunch without, it, without having to ask any more questions or look at anything else. GPA, test score, you're in. GPA, test score, you're out. Now we've got a group of kids we have to sort through in between. Um, and so that's the money. The university, the big university like Harvard, have no good excuse whatsoever, essentially. Yeah. Um, and they don't seem to want to, they teeter, they tiptoe toward it every now and then, and then back off, some of them. Um, but yeah, it is, um, we haven't sure figured out how best to play it. Part of the big problem is that, and it's meant by what I said about the state universities, the private schools are private. They make their own decisions. The public ones are responsible to the politicos. Yes. They do their funding. And so they don't want to tick off their funding. The private universities and colleges may have to deal with alumni. Mm -hmm. And some of them have said they faced a lot of problems with alumni 
over it, but they've won them over. Mm -hmm. The alumni were terrified that somehow the quality of the school was going to collapse without test scores. It didn't happen, you know. Um, but it's an issue. It's a real issue with um, scholarships. Some all on their own. Oh, you don't need test scores, but we'll give scholarships. But some of them, it turns out, I was talking to someone from George Washington University, a lot of their scholarships are endowed and they're based on test scores. There's nothing that the university can do because of the money requires it. Um, but some still do it on their own. So these are complicated. But I think the importance here is to say the colleges know you don't need test scores. That if you get rid of the test scores, you get a more diverse but still as qualified student body. One of the great examples is Texas. When affirmative action was outlawed by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court never picked it up, even though other circuits had allowed, you know, never touched it, the legislature, yet led by a combination of rural and urban representatives and senators, put in a piece of legislation, it's called the 10% rule. If you, it's now eight. So it's now, if you graduate in the top 8% of your school, you'll get automatic admission to UT Austin or any of the other universities that you may want to go to. And this raised a big furor in the suburbs, um, because what you see in Texas is it's heavily segregated. And the inner city schools are all black and Latino. And so now you had top 8% and they're all black and Latino. And if we're based on test scores, they would never get into UT Austin. But they get in. What happens? They do just as well as anybody else. Their averages are no different than anybody else in terms of graduation rates and GPA. Why? The test scores are crap. So there's been a big fight because the suburbanites don't like it because that means fewer of their white middle class constituency get in. So there's been this big fight between these Democrats from the city and these rural hardcore Republicans allied against the, well, in this case, mostly Republican, it's Texas suburbs, you know. And they got the border areas in the big cities and the rural areas against the suburbs. And they've been able to win and keep it. And there is no, if you look at two things that count, GPA and grad rates, just as good and those kids do just as well. So that kind of evidence, however, we haven't been able to affect, and it's a good question. We've been trying to figure it out for a while now. How do we use it in the policy arena um, at the state level, uh, both to change university admissions, which would be good in its own right, but also to say, look at all these colleges. They know the test scores don't matter. Stop it. Yeah. Yes, any more? We'll do one more if there's anybody. It's, been, it's late. You all have to work tomorrow, I'm sure. So you've alluded to this a couple of times. And I, the more I get deeper into this, the harder I find this question to answer is what is the end game of the people who are actually trying to promote these tests? I know there are publishing corporations that profit directly from them, so fine. But you, you, you sort of loosely refer to hedge fund operators driven by a purely uh, kind of uh, anti-government well, ideology? That, that seems very loose. Well, and, I mean, I think there's a variety. Of things. Remember, there are civil rights groups that promoted NCLB. Right. Because they wanted to know how well the schools are doing, and they bought the idea that testing would lead to more investment, more money, paying attention to kids who were ignored, and better outcomes. And the problem was, mostly it didn't lead to more money. That was not how it worked at the state level. It paid more attention to those kids, especially if they were on the bubble, because now you had to boost them, their test scores, and it did not produce better outcomes. This is clear. But they still stick with it. But that's still one force. There was a force that basically bought the the United States is falling behind the international brain race and we'll test our way to be number one in the world. They should have risked it. Well, actually, US rankings have been kind of basically flat. Hasn't changed much of anything. A little up, a little down. Um, and so that didn't work. But nonetheless, that ideology continues to be there. There was the clear ideology that we will use these results to prove public schools are bad. So Nina Shakurai Reese, who worked at the Heritage Foundation, who went on to be uh, in the Bush White House on education and has gone off, she's in the charter school world, said, now we can have the evidence to prove schools are no good and we can open the door for privatization. There is, I think, a combined ideological and financial interest. So Gates is gung-ho for charters and he's gung-ho for all of these computer-based stuff. 
Guess what the computer-based stuff is run on? Computers. Guess what gates sell? Software that runs those computers. Uh, you know, Fisher, uh, the, the GAT company, okay, who knows. But the guy who runs Dell, my book, big into this stuff too. So there's a bunch of them, even to their foundation, but the foundations themselves get more money because the owner of the company puts more money into the foundation when they sell more of their products. So this is clearly, it's going on, it's a scam. <laughs> I have long thought, I still think, the primary interest of the ruling class is to produce a workforce that's properly, as it were, stratified to do the various jobs in society, from very low wage, un so-called unskilled work, some of which is actually skilled, but whatever, all the way to the managers and the scientists and so on. You've got to sort them all out. You don't want too many of any. But of course, you want enough scientists so they'll compete with each other and you can drive the wages down, always useful, but etc. And that, I think, remains the deeper interest. And there's something of a contradiction, depending on how it plays out, with the, with the privatizing and balkanization. But clearly, the, the intensified segregation by race and class in this country proves that balkanism isn't, balkanization isn't a problem. And I think my thinking was in part that I was still thinking we were in the aftermath of the New Deal. That's long gone. We are now in the world of global neoliberalism, as we, the most of the world calls it. This country doesn't much use that word yet. What it means is the British mercantile system from the 19th century, which was called the liberal system. Why? Because nothing was provided to anybody except the rich. You had an army. You didn't even yet have real police forces. You had no social anything. You had uh, free trade, because Britain was the dominant economy, and so that was to their benefit, and so they insisted the rest of the world should have it. That was so-called neoliberal. That was liberalism. Neoliberalism is exactly that. What do you see? Free trade agreements, smash unions, cut social services, that whole agenda. But there's a whole process that got built because the system wanted a way to produce an educated workforce. That, work, work, that employers learned over time that schools were very good for this. It disciplined them, it organized them, it taught them to sit quiet and take orders for six hours a day. You only had to increase it to you know 10 or 12 after that. Thank you, the workers managed to bring it down for a while. It's been going back up. Um, so all of this stuff you know, is going on. And I think what a lot of these folks have concluded is that, first of all, they buy the Milton Friedman Friedrich Hayek, von Hayek, ideology. Government bad. The world is a market. We treat the world as a market. It's Adam Smith run amok because Adam Smith didn't believe it. But these people did. And of course, it's a very convenient logic for wealthy people because it means, hey, if we don't provide any services or services, you don't pay taxes, I get to keep more. We drive down wages, I get to keep more, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think it is driven by the rawest, most naked self-interest, coupled with an ideology that just happens to jive with their self-interest. So you can say they're more driven by ideology, ideology or more driven by the self-interest, but there's not much difference between the two. And it has won politically, by and large, in this country. So that now we have a Congress on the verge of giving more money to the rich and taking it away from everybody else. And they're about to pass it. I mean, maybe it'll manage to get stopped. I'm not terribly optimistic right now, but I'm thinking, okay, they managed to, you know, block some other crap. So we'll see. But the point is, this stuff is all around. And to assume it won't infect schooling. And so like the, the Cato Institute openly says, no public schools. Mm -hmm. They believe, I mean, they're, you know, post office and, and I believe roads are in the Constitution. I know the post office is in the Constitution. But the notion being we need roads and it's a public whatever. That's now, oh no, we'll privatize all the highways. You know? Um, and they're, they're talking this, hey, you don't even have to have toll booths to slow down the big trucks anymore, right? We got the overhead wires and zap you as you go underneath. We don't have to worry about it. We can, you know, and it's cheaper to do it. And so you see this kind of will sell off the highways. They've been doing it. They sold off bridges and highways in this country. For a and then, so, that ideology, you know, and when you at the last, schools are a big market. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that has been off limits 
most of that money, except for the school supplies and the construction costs, but really it's been off limits. Hey, if we can drive down teacher wages, so we can sell more software, blah, 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 more money into private pockets. I'm sorry, yes? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I used to be in the field of education technology, and the whole reason, I mean, my perspective on the whole reason for the Common Core was to create the common standards so that you could create the personalized learning system, because without the Common Core, you couldn't create that. So, so if this, the Common Core was to provide the ability to have the personalized learning systems that are then tied to the test, which is the way to keep teachers' wages down and drill and, drill and kill kids. I'm not totally sure you need the Common Core, because after all, we sold now we're only a couple of companies selling textbooks all across the country. So I don't know if you have to do it that way, but it helps. No question. It helps that process. And indeed, by marketing it as based on these common core high-level standards, it helps people think if they don't investigate closely, oh, well, well, this is better learning. This is higher. It's rigorous. It's deeper thinking. It's as long as you don't look, as long as you don't open the box. Thank you, everybody. Let's thank everybody. For